Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I am going to go through a few housekeeping items. First, I wanted to show our legal disclaimer. Uh, this presentation is not a recommendation to um, invest in our funds. It, if you are interested in investing with us, please request a PPM. Um, this is for educational purposes only and our offerings are only available to accredited investors. And you can also reach out through tempofunding.com slash IR call and schedule a call with me or email us at invest at tempofunding.com. Um, scan this QR code and you can schedule a call with me directly. But again, our website is tempofunding.com. And so with that, I'm going to give uh, the screen over to Zach. Zach Wilson is a representative of um, Quest. He is someone I reach out to often to get help with all kinds of different things to do with um, IRAs. And he has a lot of really great information. I wanted to ask him some more specific, I guess, advanced things to know when you are using a self-directed IRA. And, um, you know, there's a lot of basic information out there, but as you have used your self-directed IRA to invest, you learn that there are different things throughout the year that you need to do. Um, there's different techniques that you can use the self-directed IRA for. So there were several questions that I asked Zach um, to present on today. And I think that, um, we're going to open it up for questions at the end. So please take notes. And um, um, or Zach, do you want them to ask questions as we go? Um, yeah, yeah, feel free to ask questions as we go. Uh, what I'll, I'll keep an eye on the, the Q&A. If you see it starts to pile up and I'm just kind of rolling, you know, just just uh, let me know that there's questions in there. We'll get them addressed. Um, we got a good bit to cover. Uh, so, you know, by all by all means, I want people to ask them as we cover each topic. And that way, you know, we, you know it, it's on fresh on their minds. Yeah. Well, Zach, thanks for being here today. Um, give a little bit about your background and and why you're a uh, you know a great guest on our, our show here. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys for having me. Um, so a little bit about me. You know, I I'm one of the IRA specialists here at Quest Trust Company. So you know, when I started off at Quest, I was finishing up my degree in finance at U of H. Um, and to be honest with you, when I first joined Quest, it was kind of just to get my foot in the door uh, at you know in the finance in the finance space. I knew I didn't want to necessarily go traditional finance route. I kind of had you know some interest in the alternative asset route. Um, but you know, six years later, nearly six years later, you know, I'm I'm. I haven't left. I don't plan on going anywhere. You know, it's something that once I got in, you know, I, I joined in on the on the auditing side. So I got a lot of exposure to all really the investments, how they were structured, you know, seeing going through these contracts. Um, so it was very beneficial to me. And then when I got to join the IRA specialist side, I was essentially now seeing the front end, right? I was seeing the conversations that were that people were having that were forming these deals. I was seeing how those relationships are built, you know, how people are networking. So it's been incredibly uh, you know, valuable to me as it personally, just the benefits that I've gotten just simply working here at Quest. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm happy to share the information that we have. It's something that I don't think a lot of people know about. Uh, it's becoming definitely more popular, especially in the most in, in you know in recent years. But it's something that's not nearly as well known. You know that you know, the capabilities you have with your retirement vehicle. Yeah, I can say that I've watched some of the webinars from Quest, and they're very good nuggets and jewels you'll find on their YouTube. So if you haven't checked it out, definitely look there because you'll learn all sorts of ways you never imagined were possible to use your self-directed IRA. Exactly. Yeah. Creativity is, is kind of the key. You know, it's, it's you could really tailor these accounts to to fit your retirement needs and your investment strengths, I guess is the best way to put it. All right. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. So uh, we're going to really jump right into it just because we there's going to be a lot we are going to be wanting to cover here. Um, and I'll kind of go through what to expect. And as you know, as we said before, ask questions as we go along. I'm happy to address those just to kind of clarify. Um, if you have more specific things where they're you know, unique to your situation, I'll have my contact information listed at the end. Feel free to reach out to me. All right. So before we get started, we've got to give the disclaimer. Everything that you're about to see here is for educational purposes only. It's really important to understand the role that we play when it comes to your retirement investing. 
We're here to offer as many resources and as much education as we can to our clients and investors. But that being said, Quest does not offer any any tax, legal, investment, or structuring advice, nor do we endorse any specific investments. All right, so now going for, on the agenda, what we're going to be covering today, we're going to do a quick overview of self-directed IRAs for those of you who aren't familiar with them. You know, we're going to introduce them conceptually, and then we'll look a bit further into some of the mechanics needed, some of the requirements needed. So we'll talk about the dreaded fair market valuations. You know, that's the, the most painful part of the year for, for Quest and our, uh, you know, and, and our investment sponsors as well. So we'll talk about that, kind of how to mitigate um, and get ahead of that. <clears throat> we're also going to talk about Roth conversions. Roth conversions is a very powerful tool. Um, it's something that if utilized correctly can be very beneficial to you, not only currently, but also down the line when it comes to you actually taking your retirement funds out. But you want to be able to plan that appropriately. So we're going to look at some of the considerations for the Roth conversions. We're also going to take a look at investment considerations. And specifically, when we're talking about investment considerations. We're going to talk about the ideal types of investment for an IRA, right? Because there are investments, you can do all kinds of investments. There are some, but there are some that by nature are more fit for a retirement vehicle versus others. And also, we're going to talk about more advanced topics like K1, what to expect, how to use it, where it comes into play. We'll talk about depreciation within an IRA on the assets that it holds. And then we'll also cover UBIT and UDFI uh, as well, just to understand the full picture of some of the more advanced uh, uh, things you could do with an IRA. So for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we are Quest Trust Company. You know, we're the largest self-directed IRA custodian in the state of Texas. We have roughly 20,000 active investor clients all across the country. Uh, earlier this year, we hit our $3 billion in assets under administration mark. So it's you know, a huge milestone for us. It's been very organic growth, and it's you know we're hoping to see $4 billion here coming up shortly. We have over 100 employees, 34 of which are certified IRA service professionals. So what does that mean? That means when you give us a call, you're not going to get an answering machine. You're going to get someone who answers the phone and can answer most of the questions that you have regarding your account. And if you want to take a deeper dive, we've got 34 certified IRA service professionals, CISP certifications, uh, to take that dive with you, all right? So we'll be able to handle any any uh, any issues you have within your account. So first to start, let's jump into self-directed IRAs 101, right? Tax advantage investing. Um, and we're going to kind of overview this. We're not going to dive too deep just because we've got a lot to cover. But first, we always like to introduce, well, what is a self-directed IRA? Well, believe it or not, the term self-directed is really just a marketing term to illustrate you're the one in control of the investments, there's no legal distinction between your self-directed traditional or your self-directed Roth IRA here at Quest versus a traditional or Roth you would have at any other custodian like Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard, right? The biggest difference is the custodian themselves. Those custodians allow you to take your retirement funds and put them into public assets. Quest allow you to take, allows you to take that same retirement those same retirement funds, put them into private assets, specifically real estate style investments is what we specialize in. All right, so knowing that, knowing that self-direction is more of a description of the account, well, what accounts can be self-directed? Well, at Quest, we hold seven different types of accounts that fall under three different categories. The first one is going to be your personal accounts. These are the accounts that just about every single person has heard of, and that's going to be the traditional and the Roth IRA. Now, by far the most common one is going to be the traditional IRA. Now, I don't, not necessarily because it's a better account. I don't think that's the best way to think about it. Each one's going to play its own role. But the reason that traditional IRA is so popular is because of its pre-tax status. So if you're rolling funds over from a 401k and you've been adding pre-tax contributions along with your employer to that 401k, well, to roll it over without any sort of tax implication, you're going to roll it over to an account that matches that pre-tax status. That's where that traditional IRA comes into play. From there, those funds are growing tax deferred. And then come retirement, once you take them out, they're essentially being added to your adjusted gross income for the year in which you took that distribution. Now, on the flip side is my personal favorite account, the Roth IRA. The Roth IRA is a post-tax account. That post-tax status gives it two distinct advantages. The first one is there going to be contributions made to the Roth IRA, so funds coming out of your own personal checking or savings account. Well, those funds, those contributions could come out anytime tax and penalty free, right? No matter how long you've had the account, no matter what age you are, contributions are the first thing to come out and they're never taxed or penalized. So over the next five years, let's say you put six thousand a year in there. Well, at the end of year five, you got thirty thousand dollars. And at that point, let's say you, you decide, man, I, I need a new vehicle, but I really don't want a car note, right? Or maybe I, you know, I want to purchase the house and I would like to put more towards the down payment. Right? Well, you've got that pool of thirty thousand to pull from for you to use personally as you see fit. 
Now, the second distinct advantage is that uh, that, that post-tax status gives is the growth in the account is now growing tax-free. So that means as long as when you're taking the funds out, all right, you're taking the funds out and you're over the age of 59 and a half, and you've had a Roth IRA open and funded for five years, right? You meet both of those requirements, then everything you take out, no matter how much that account has grown, everything comes out tax and penalty free. That means if given enough time, that Roth can be composed of mostly earnings that taxation has never touched, and you get to pull those out without Uncle Sam taking a dime, right? That's why that Roth IRA is such an attractive account. The second category is going to be the employer plans. Now, not going to dive too deep into these. Just know that these are for self-employed individuals looking to take advantage of higher contribution limits. This is the SEP, the simple, and the solo 401k. Now, when I'm talking about higher contribution limits, the traditional and the Roth are sitting at 7,000 a year as of 2024. And if you're over 50, that bumps up to 8,000. Whereas the employer plans, the employer plans, for example, in the SEP or the, or the solo 401k, allow upwards of 69,000 in a single year. And if you're over 50 for the 401k, that can go up to 70, I think 74, five, right? So 74,500 going into that solo 401k, which is massive, right? It's massive but for the annual contribution. The final category is going to be the specialty plans. So the specialty plans aren't retirement vehicles. They're vehicles meant uh, designed to help you now. Well, that's going to be the health savings account and the Coverdell education savings account. All right, again, I won't dive too deep into these. If you're interested in learning more about either the employer plans or the specialty plans, send me over an email. I'm happy to have a consultation with you. Uh, but just know that the Coverdell ESA is designed to been uh, designed to go towards educational expenses for your children. And the HSA, which I think is one of the most underutilized accounts in the US, is designed for healthcare benefits, right? So this is gonna be designed so that funds go in tax, uh, tax deductible, right? So you get the benefits of the traditional IRA, they're growing and will be distributed tax and penalty free as long as they're going towards a qualified medical expense. So you get the benefit of that Roth, right? HSA, I know what you're thinking. Well, what's a qualified medical expense in the eyes of the IRS? It's probably some very niche list. Uh, believe it or not, that's not the case. The list of what you can't spend it on is shorter than the list of what you can spend it on. Uh, we're talking everything, copay, prescription drugs, over-the-counter drugs, dental, vision, all of that can be covered with an HSA coming out tax and penalty-free. So it's a very powerful account uh, if used properly. So now that we know what types of accounts can be self-directed, why? Why should you? All right, well, first, diversification is something that you know everyone will preach. You talk to any financial advisor, they're going to tell you, okay, make sure you're diversified in your portfolio. Well, let's not put all your eggs in one basket, right? Well, if you're in the public sphere, right, you're really, no matter if you're going to bonds, mutual funds, individual stocks, all right, you're really putting your eggs in different parts of what is overall the same basket. With a self-directed IRA, a custodian like Quest allows us for that true diversification outside of the public market. Right, allows you to really invest into things you know best, more tangible assets like real estate. You can even get into things like investing into funds, doing private money lending. All of that's accessible outside of the public sphere. The second, one of the second advantages is going to be the tax savings. Right, and unless if you're doing if you're a real estate investor right, and you're doing these investments under your name personally, let's say you got a property, you fix it, flip it, you sell it. Well, at that point, you really got two choices. You're either going to pay the taxation on it, right, on that income, or you're going to try to put it into something like a 1031 exchange and try to defer that taxation until later. Well, by their very nature, these accounts, the self-directed IRAs, they will negate the need for that 1031 because they are built tax-deferred in cases like the Roth IRA, tax-free. So you're not restricted on the value of your next investment, the asset class on your next investment, the timeline on your next investment. They are coming back tax deferred or tax free. So it negates that need for that 1031. And finally, it's going to be investing in what you know best. If you're on this call, you're either looking to build a foundation of alternative asset knowledge, or you already have that foundation you're looking to add to it. So why not utilize that knowledge? Utilize the experience that you have, utilize the network that you've built to invest in the, in the assets that you know best, rather than putting them into the market and just crossing your fingers and hoping that they grow in the way that you want them to. Right now, you're not going to get all these benefits without some restrictions. So let's take a look at that. What are those restrictions? So they're going to fall into three different categories, the first of which being your people restrictions. These are what's known as the disqualified parties to an IRA. Right? It's going to be you as the individual, your spouse, your lineal ascendants, so parents, grandparents, your lineal descendants, so children, grandchildren, their spouses, 
Are any companies that those people own, control, manage, or are highly compensated by? Really, companies that they're affiliated with. That's who cannot coming or, or do deals with the IRA. It can't be on the other side of the transaction line. All right? If we talk about partnering, that's a different subject, but we kind of address that if you want to learn more about that. Uh, the second restriction is going to be the transaction restrictions. What you can't do with those disqualified parties. So you cannot buy, sell, loan, trade, extend a service to, or receive a benefit from uh, either one of those people, whether it's direct or indirect. All right, so essentially you, you can't buy any assets from them. You can't trade any assets. Uh, you can't, if you own a, an I, uh, I'm sorry, you own a property in your IRA, you can't go then cut the lawn because now you've just provided a service for your IRA, right? You really wanna be hands off and you wanna have any of your investments completely separate from any of the IRA's investments. And finally, it's gonna be the investment restrictions. Very short list, very short list. The only investment restrictions there are within an IRA is gonna be collectibles. So things like uh, vintage cars, uh, arts, things that where the value is more subjective rather than objective, and also uh, life insurance contracts. They just don't want you investing in those with your IRA. All right, so what can we invest into? What can you invest into with a self-directed IRA? Well, just about anything, right? You want to take direct title to something, you go into the real estate space, absolutely you can do so. Whether it's fix and flip, buy and hold as a rental property, even more advanced stuff like foreclosures, options, unimproved land, tax liens. Let's say you don't want to take direct title and you'd rather just simply invest into a fund, right? A fund like one of the Tempo funds. Well, you can do that within your IRA here at Quest. It allows for investments into things like debt funds, into things like uh limited liability companies, joint ventures, right? You can really structure those entities as you see fit. Also, let's say you don't want to invest into a fund. You'd rather just get a consistent monthly return and not really have to think about it. Well, maybe you get into private money lending, right? This allows you to be the bank, essentially. Your IRA gets to lend and you negotiate with the borrower what the terms are, maturity, the maturity date. Is it going to be balloon note, amortized? You really get to customize these investments to fit your needs and your risk level. All right, so with that, there's also some responsibilities that Quest has on the administrative side. So as part of those responsibilities, first one is that we have bookkeeping and record keeping responsibilities, All right? Which means if, as we're investing, as you're investing, we're going through, we're auditing the documentation, checking for prohibited transactions, we're checking to make sure the vesting is correct, and we're gonna keep those files uh, within your file here at Quest. We also have to provide that record key, I'm sorry, the, that bookkeeping for you. So within your Quest portal, you're going to see all the transactions listed within your IRA. You'll be able to see any distributions, right? Any of those transactions happening will be accessible in your online portal. We also have to facilitate the transactions that you're looking to do. So those transactions that you're looking to do is mean the purchase of an asset, the uh, uh, sending in a contribution, requesting a distribution. We're facilitating those within your IRA. And then finally, we have regulatory reporting requirements. These are a couple, this takes a form of a couple of different things. One of them being the 1099s that are going to gen be generated if you take distributions. One of them are the 5498s, which get generated annually, essentially showing any contributions and the updated value of your account. And we also have to report the dreaded fair market value. Oh, it's a pain. It's a pain. It's a manual process. And it's kind of one of the things that we can't get around, right? Um, so we do our best to try and mitigate it. So let's talk about it. All right. So what we're looking at right now is for the fair market values, it's easier than you think, right? You're going to be receiving emails, you know, months in advance letting you know, hey, fair market values are coming up, right? They're going to let you know, hey, these are due by this date. They're usually due by January 15th. Uh, if you are investing with a team like Tempo, Tempo is actually taking care of that for you. What Tempo does, essentially, they compile all of their Quest, all of their Quest clients. They've compiled their names, accounts, numbers, and values, and they send that over. So for you, there's not really much you need to do. If you've received those emails, just hang tight, right? One thing you have to consider is that we have to manually go through these. And in doing so, you have 20,000 active investor clients, even if we average just two investments per, per client, you're looking at nearly 40,000 investments we've got to comb through. So it takes us a while to get through these. So if you've submitted it, right, rest, 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 you know, rest assured, they've received it, but you probably will still get a reminder after it doesn't mean you haven't submitted everything. You can always give me a call. You can always speak to one of our IRA specialists. You can speak to the FMV team and ask like, hey, can you can you see that I've submitted or can you acknowledge the receipt? And then we'll go ahead and do that for you. All right. Um, so if you are not invested with Tempo, right? If you, first thing we want to do is we'll call that uh, 
you want to call the investment sponsor and ask, hey, are you guys sending that over for us? Right? Is this something that you go manually do? Because not every investment sponsor does that. All right. Not a problem if they don't. You just want to see, okay, if not, here are the documentations that we're going to need. Right. So if it's going into real estate, we can accept things like a county tax appraisal. That's something you can get online yourself. Uh, if it's a promissory note, you really just need the amortization schedule. Or you need an amortization schedule, or if it's devalued, if you're thinking it's a bad note, we need an attorney from the letter saying, I'm um, sorry, a letter from the attorney stating that. If it's a private entity, then we really just need a letter from the managing member stating your name, your account number, and the value of your IRA. All right, so fairly straightforward. Um, yeah, I wish I wish there was a more automated way to do this where you could just simply submit a value and then that be that. But unfortunately, one of the requirements, especially being under the Texas Department of Banking, is that we have to manually go through and we have to have supporting documentation for any of the investments uh, or the investment values that you that you're claiming. All right. So uh, any questions having to do with those? Because that's that's my recap of self-directed IRAs. And then we're going to take a look at Roth conversions here next. I, I do have a question um, yes. and it kind of ties into the next topic. Um, does it matter what time of year you submit this fair market valuation? Are they going to say if I turn it in um, from a, a third party in the middle of the year, are you going to request another one in the beginning of the next year? Or does that last for one year? How does that work? So the fair market values, once they're submitted, we can only hold on to them for 60 days, right? So really November, December, that's the sweet spot to, to get them submitted. If they're submitted after, not a big deal. Essentially what you can do is let us know, right? If if any of your particular investor is saying, okay, hey, you know, I'm, I'm working on it or I'm working with my investment sponsor to, to get it in. If we just got an email stating that, we're going to work with you, right? That, that, fifth, that January 15th is not like a, oh, you missed it, so... That's it. Right? We'll, we'll absolutely work with any of our any of our clients as long as they're working towards it. So some of the funds, because of how many assets there are in them, take a long time to compile that fourth quarter um, report, basically. And so it does go into the next year past the January 15th. Um, and I know from experience, you know, we let Quest know this is going to take a while. Um, and the date you said it's got to be within 60 days, but the dates that were given by the third party fund administrator on like the third quarter of the year are outside of that window. Mm -hmm. So how do we really, I guess, is it okay to accept that third quarter um, report and what's the timing? So if I got the third quarter report and it's basically in December when I'm getting this, if I submit it and tell tell them, hey, I just got this from the third party fund administrator, but it's dated September 30th, I've gotten pushback sometimes from different IRA companies on that. But um, that's actual an actual case with our funds. That is that a, a, something you see commonly with funds? Yeah. So in in that 60 day window, keep in mind that that's the 60 days, how long we can hold on to it. Right. So like once we receive it. Let's say, you know, if we receive it December 1st, that means we can hold on to that. And that value is good until January, you know, January 30th, January 31st, right? Uh, so if it's coming in, like if it's received later, but let's say, you know, let's say it's not going out until, you know, uh, maybe towards the end of the first quarter, just to throw out a, a timeline there. But we're seeing that, hey, this was, this is actually the value end of Q4. That's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine because that just means once we receive it now, that's good for 60 days. We can't take a valuation in, September and have that be good for the end of year reporting, right? Because that would be out of the 60 day window of Quest holding on to it. The date that's the the confusing part because the date is for the third quarter, but we got the thing from the fund administration and the end of December. And so the date on it shows September, <laughs> but that's where it gets a little complicated. And sometimes I get pushback for that reason. Yeah. No, that that is it's always something that, you know we work on. Uh, I wish I could tell you it's, it's going to be a guaranteed, like, yes, we'll accept it. Uh, but it's also going to be, you know, we, we're kind of changing our compliance requirements based off what the Texas Department of Banking and the Texas Department of Banking can be very, uh, they can be sticklers um, when it comes to that stuff. So I'd say if it's going to be more than likely the best route would be just to turn in the Q4 metrics late rather than turning in the Q3 metrics towards the end of the year. 
I don't know that'll work in this situation. I think what would be best is if I did the mass, you know, compiled and said, you know, accept this as of this date, even though it's dated September. Uh, I think that's what's worked in the past, but yeah, it does take longer for funds to compile. So the first quarter uh, might not come out for a while because Q4 takes a long time to gather all those K1s from different entities. Yeah. And sometimes they don't send them out until June, July, you know, and then here you, yeah. you haven't been able to report that fair market valuation within that time frame at all. So I think that, um, you know, there isn't really an easy fix for this problem uh, yeah. other than that email and that I was just explaining. But um, if there's any other questions, we can move on to the Roth side of this, because I think that is where a lot more questions come in and how this works. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so we'll jump right into the Roth conversions. So uh, first, let's take an understanding and just break down what they are, right? What is a Roth conversion? We'll talk about the what, the why, and the when, uh, when considering. So first, just as a simple breakdown, Roth conversion is just taking the funds within your pre-tax account. Most of the time, this is going to be your traditional IRA. However, it does include things like the SEP or the simple. And really, you're just moving them over to that Roth IRA that you established. That's all a Roth conversion is, right? And it's in its most basic form. We're just moving them from pre-tax to post-tax. Now, as such, there's going to be some tax uh, tax obligations there. And so let's talk about that a bit. And first, let's understand the Roth IRA and why people will consider doing this. So first, the Roth IRA is really just going to be the post-tax version of your traditional IRA. Traditional IRA and the Roth IRA are limited to $7,000 a year starting in 2024. If you're over 50, that bumps up to $8,000. One of the differences between the Roth IRA and the traditional, though, is that the Roth, the Roth IRA income limits are going to dictate whether you're able to contribute to a Roth IRA at all, versus the traditional IRA income limits just dictate the, the tax deductibility of your contributions. All right, so something to consider. Uh, if you ever hear a backdoor Roth conversion, that's one of the solutions people will, people will usually pursue if they're over those income limits. And you can see the income limits on the right side for 2023 and 2024. All right, so some of the advantages to the Roth IRA is that for the prior year, contributions can be funded until tax filing deadline uh, of that year without, ex uh, without extension. So that means for 2024, you're able to contribute to your Roth IRA up until tax filing deadline in 2025, which if not April 15th, you know, if that falls on a weekend, then it's the next business day. Also, non-working spouses qualify for a Roth IRA if married filing jointly and the spouse has compensation, right? So if you're in a situation where one of your spouses is stay at home and they're watching and they're, they're taking care of the children and the other spouse works, well, that other spouse is if they're filing jointly, they are one taxable entity, right? They're one taxable unit. So the compensation of one spouse also applies to the other as far as eligibility to contribute to a Roth IRA. Next is that qualified distributions from a Roth IRA are tax-free forever. That means once you hit 59 and a half and you've had a Roth open and funded for five years, all distributions come out tax and penalty-free. Right? I know one of my clients, he exclusively does investments in his Roth IRA. He doesn't do any investments personally anymore because he meets both of those requirements. And now he's just using the cash flow generated on the Roth IRA to take distributions on a monthly basis. He's got tax and penalty-free income. Right? It's really something that... You know, in my mind, that's like that. That's the goal for retirement. That's what I'm working towards personally. The next is that there are no required minimum distributions for the Roth IRA, right? Because it's a post-tax account. That means once you hit those qualifications, there really is no reason for the IRS to require you taking those distributions because they're not going to get any taxation out of it. They really no longer care what you're doing with that money. And also, you can create tax-free income for your heirs because a Roth IRA can be passed down and inherited to your beneficiaries. Now, because there is a, uh, a tax uh, obligation on the movement of funds, right? We're going pre-tax to post-tax. There are some considerations that you want to think about before doing a Roth conversion. One of the first ones is what are your assumptions about tax rates and tax laws generally in the future, right? Obviously, we're coming up to an election year. This is a big consideration for a lot of people. What do you think the tax rates are going to look like in the future? And you should factor that in when considering, okay, do we do a Roth conversion now? Or maybe do we wait? Because I think that tax rates are going to be a little bit lower, right? Next, do you expect to be in a lower or higher tax bracket when you retire? This is unique to every person individually, right? Because 
are you someone who's like like a 65 i really i want to retire i don't want to have i don't want to work at all i have no income so i'm going to be relying solely on these distributions so that means if i do a if i have a lower tax bracket then maybe i hold it in the traditional ira well maybe you're on the flip side maybe you're someone who sees himself working for you know well well past retirement age so you're thinking by the time you need to start pulling out of this you're still going to have income so you could be in a decently high tax bracket so maybe doing the roth conversion now on the smaller amount is the better option you always want to talk with the cpa when doing this so you can get the full financial scope of your situation next is can you afford to pay the taxes from oh, can you afford to pay the taxes from outside uh, from outside of your ira so when you do the conversion right that is added to your adjusted gross income for the year in which you did the conversion so that means you, there could be a decent tax burden if you converted a good bit, you need to be sure you can cover the tax obligation surrounding that conversion in the year that you did it. Next is, will the conversion put you into a higher marginal tax bracket or will it affect deductions, credits, things like Social Security or Medicare due to, due to the increase in your adjusted gross income? As you get older, once you reach Medicare age, it's absolutely something you want to consider. Is the conversion, if I do it now, it's added to my adjusted gross income. So is that going to take me out of the bracket that I'm currently in? And will that affect my eligibility for things like Social Security, for things like Medicare? Right? Is that going to have an impact on me? And will that impact outweigh the benefits of doing the conversion? All right. Next is, do you want to leave the payment of taxes to your beneficiaries? Or will you be paying the, paying the taxes now so that your beneficiaries receive tax-free income for their lifetime? All right now, the rules are changing. The rules change a little bit now. Instead of it being a lifetime, it's going to be a ten-year rule, right? So that, but that's still something to consider. Is that a Roth IRA being inherited means tax and penalty-free distributions if you met those requirements before they inherited them? And finally, what are your projected gains on the investments? All right, knowing that when I'm moving over, I have to pay a tax burden. Right, how long is it going to take me until I make up that tax burden? All right. Am I going to start taking distributions before I ever make that up? So I'll really be in the hole when I start taking distributions or do I have enough time or expect a high enough return to make up for the tax burden that I paid so that I am coming out positive at the end when I'm taking these distributions out. All right. So there's a lot of considerations you want to have whenever you're looking at a Roth conversion to be sure you're always making the best financial decision for you. It sounds attractive to have funds put into a post tax and be, have tax free distributions. But there's a lot that goes into it, you know, especially when you're looking at your income, how old you are, what are your retirement plans, what's your retirement situation looking like as a whole, that are going to dictate whether that's the smartest decision for you. So let's look at some common questions about Roth conversions. So some people will say, well, I thought if I made too much money, I couldn't do a Roth conversion. Well, that's not true at all. Remember, the income limit is going to be dictating whether or not you can contribute to a Roth IRA. When we're talking about Roth conversions, anyone Anyone can convert their pre-tax funds over to their Roth IRA at any time, at any age, without penalty. There's no penalty for doing a Roth conversion because it's still ending up in a retirement vehicle. You're not taking a distribution of these funds personally. Next is, can I do a partial conversion? Some people will say, look, man, I, I really don't want to, you know, I've got a good bit saved up in my traditional. I really don't want to have to shoulder that tax burden all in one single year. Perfect. By no means do you have to. You can absolutely do partial conversions, and that's actually a common thing that we'll see is maybe over five years, 10 years, you just convert a little bit at a time, right? It helps lower the tax burden any given year. It can also keep you in the same tax bracket that you're currently in, right? So you can absolutely customize the process of converting it over to fit your needs. And finally, can I convert assets to my Roth or is it only cash? Absolutely, there can be asset conversions. All right. Now, the conversion of cash is going to be obviously simpler because it's just a movement of funds, right? You fill out a one a one page form and then we convert those funds to 24 to 48 hours for the conversion of an asset because it's a con uh, considered a taxable event. It's going to need a little bit more paperwork. We need to get a hard valuation of that asset so we know what value to convert it at. All right. Now, this can work to your advantage given some some investment structures. All right. If you ever hear anything called like the J curve. The J-curve is something that has Roth conversions in their focus. The reason being is because just how some of these investments are structured is that when you first invest, if you get it appraised, you're catching it at a dip. Well, if you catch it at a dip, 
that means it's going to get appraised for a lower value and then you can convert it that value you know it's a way to it's a way to utilize the investments natural structure to benefit yourself personally right and makes that make the most sense for you uh Deanna if you want to if you want to speak on that a little bit yeah the j curve is something that our growth funds had uh you know plain planned on and the growth funds gave the opportunity to do a Roth conversion. Um, they also offered depreciation, which we'll get on to later on. But I think if you have not looked into doing a Roth conversion on a close-ended fund or a syndication, you definitely need to speak to a CPA and see if there's an opportunity to do that because the tax savings when you convert to the Roth is substantial. I think it's I don't know for sure, but Zach, can you tell us if this is real estate, is that the best way to get the tax advantage or is there another asset out there that is better? Not that, not that I'm aware of, honestly, especially when we're looking into these funds like syndications. I mean, that's just because, because, you know, like we said, like that, the structure of them, that J curve naturally built in, you're not, you're not having to manipulate anything. You're not having to like try and, you know, uh, get around what are the rules. It naturally, that value is going to dip before it then climbs back up. And all you're doing is converting at the dip. That's it. This is the same thing that goes, okay, if I had, if I held stock in my IRA and I saw that, man, this was, it's a pretty rough year. My stock has gone down and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to convert. I'll convert now so that hopefully in the future, all that growth I'm then going to experience happens in my Roth IRA, right? This okay. is happening, you know, this is this is just now in an alternative asset, in a closed asset, like you said, um, a closed fund. So I, I think that I, I don't know of any better way to do it. Yeah, so this is not a possibility in uh, a lot of uh, other assets, but real estate is the best one to do it with. From my experience, I've seen people do uh, a lot with these. Um, and we uh, still are seeing this actually with our new fund, Tempo Advantage Fund, it offers the ability to do the Roth conversion. So um, talk to me more about that and I'll, I'll see if I can get you some more information if you're interested. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Right, so now that we've talked about the Roth conversion, let's take a look at some of the investment considerations whenever you're looking to utilize your retirement funds for investments. All right, so in the slide that we were looking at, what's open to you, right? You really have the possibility of investing into just about anything you could invest into personally, utilizing your IRA funds. That being said, not every investment is treated equal when it comes to a retirement vehicle. All right now, investing with retirement vehicles, these by the very nature of these accounts, they favor passive investments. So things like private entities, promissory notes, those are going to be the investments that work the best within an IRA because of their passive nature, All right? So speaking to that passive nature, we want to look at something uh, specifically looking at syndications. So I think syndications, giving an example of that, will allow me to highlight everything uh, that really the advanced parts of an IRA can get into. So things like depreciation, things like looking at a K-1, K-1 utilization, what to expect on those. And then looking at how to handle UBIT and UDFI and understand those, All right? So let's take a look at that. So syndications and UBIT and UDFI. So to cover this, we'll talk about UDFI, UBIT. We'll talk about K-1 utilization. And we'll also look at cost segregation, forced depreciation when it comes to your IRA, All right? Uh, this is a part, definitely stop and ask questions, guys, if you have them, because I want to be sure we understand this. I'm going to take this really step by step from the very beginning to the very end so that we understand all the concepts. And at the end, we'll take a look at like an example investment just so we can wrap it all and tie it together. All right. So what is UBIT UDFI? So UDFI, all that refers to is unrelated debt financed income. This is the income derived from an investment within the IRA that is debt leveraged. All right. Easy way to think about it, if your IRA borrows funds via a non-recourse note to purchase property, that's a debt leveraged investment, right? That UDFI, right, that income generates a tax known as UBIT, Unrelated Business Income Tax. This is a tax that can be incurred within an IRA given very specific scenarios, and it's a tax paid by the IRA, not by you as the individual, all right? So three scenarios that can trigger UBIT in an IRA. The first is owning personal property and making a profit off of it. So essentially, uh, the, the way this happens the most, uh, most at Quest is going to be people owning mobile homes. If you own a mobile home that's not attached to real estate, then it's going to be considered personal property and will trigger UBIT. 
The second one is running a business within the IRA. It's not very common uh, just because of it, it really, it, that you can eat into the advantages that running the business within the IRA has. Uh, but for example, my IRA can purchase a Starbucks franchise, right? And if I didn't have to pay taxes, I could undercut everyone else in the area. The IRS knows this. And so running a business within the IRA, all of the income generated from that business are going to be subject to UBIT. Right. Finally, the most common one that we see is debt leverage investing, right? So the triggering that UDFI. So let's take a look and break that down, what that looks like. So in two scenarios, right? Purchasing a property, you, if you're doing it personally, well, you, you go to purchase that property, right? And whether you are borrowing funds or not, doesn't really matter. Once you fix it, flip it and sell it for a profit, taxation is going to be taken out of those proceeds. Or you can try to 1031, but again, that's just really deferring the taxation until later. With an IRA, it's going to work a little bit different. If the IRA is simply purchasing the property with the cash that it has available, well, it can fix it, flip it, and sell it. And those proceeds are coming directly back to the IRA without taxation touching them. Right? There's no taxation involved in that transaction. But now let's involve debt leveraging. Right? So in this case, you've got the IRA. Right? That IRA will then go to an institution or it can go to a private lender. doesn't really matter. But it will borrow funds via a non-recourse note. Or if the IRA is borrowing funds, it's got to be via a non-recourse note. And this is going to function the exact same way like a traditional mortgage would. The only difference is that it contains non-recourse language that states in the case of default, the lender cannot go after any other assets, either held by you as the individual or held by your IRA. They can only go after that single property. All right. So it uses the funds from that to now purchase the property. It fixes it, flips it. And now rather than the funds going directly back to the IRA, it will have to pay UBIT on the income, right? So it's not going to be 100% of the income. One important thing to understand, especially when it comes to UDFI, is that the taxable portion of your income is based off of the debt leveraged portion of the investment. For example, if I were to pay, let's say I were to borrow 70% of the funds that I need, right? $100,000 property, I put $30,000 down, I borrow 70, now it's 70% debt leveraged. Let's say I fix it, I flip it, and I, I double my money. Let's say I sell it for a profit of 100000 right? Amazing opportunity. But what that means is that because it was 70% debt leveraged, 70% of those proceeds are going to be considered taxable, right? They're going to be considered taxable. So not the whole thing. It's not taxed at 70%, but 70000 is considered taxable, and they're taxable at trust rates, right? Now, because they are taxable, now that we've introduced the IRA to taxation, we will also introduce the IRA to deductions, things like depreciation, right? So let's take a look at really how that manifests when we're talking about syndication investments. Right now, to do that, we're going to look at K-1 utilization and where that cost segregation or that forced depreciation shows up. So I'd like to take a step back here to kind of establish the structure of a syndication because I feel like that will give you a more rounded, well-rounded picture of where your IRA gets affected and how the metrics get there. All right, so understanding the structure of, a, of most syndications. So most investment funds that you're going to invest into are going to be structured very similarly. They're generally going to be set up as an LLC that are going to be taxed as a partnership. Right, that LLC gives it that limited liability coverage, and the partnership means that it's now going to be a pass-through entity, passing through, through to the partners of the uh, of the partnership. Generally, this is going to be managed by the syndicator's management entity, all right? And the IRA is simply acting as a member of that LLC. Right now, even though it is a pass-through entity, that entity is the entity is still separate from the partners, and therefore it must file a tax return. Right. And how it files a tax return is going to be via a form 1065. It's the U.S. return of partnership income. All right. Now, within that form 1065, there is going to be the Schedule K. All right. So the Schedule K, and I'll, I'll put it up right here so you can take a look at it. Really, the Schedule K, what that is, is that it is essentially just acting as the aggregate income or loss that will be split amongst the partners. Right. That's what's getting listed on this Schedule K. All right. Now, now the managing partner, they're going to be the ones, or the syndicator, they're going to be the ones handling this. But I just want you to understand what you what they're doing really on these forms. All right. Now, from the Schedule K, you can derive the Schedule K-1. All right. So the Schedule K-1 is going to be very similar to the Schedule K, except that most items are apportioned amongst each partner's K-1 according to their ownership interests. 
So really it's just the individual partner split of the gain or loss listed on that schedule K. All right, and here's a picture of the K1 that you receive versus the, K, the schedule K that they're deriving those metrics from. All right, and taking a look, you'll notice, especially in part three, part three is almost matching box for box what's listed on the schedule K. All right, if you're going through just like one, uh, really all of them are going to be matching nearly you know, exact, uh, just your portion of it. That's all this is doing. So let's look at what to expect when we're receiving that K1. All right now, each one's going to be a little bit different, but generally speaking, what we're looking at is on item E, it's going to be listing the partner's information, right? So in this case, the IRA is the partner, but usually how these are built is it's going to list the, the uh, custodian's EIN on part E. Right now, like I said, I am by no means a tax expert. This is just kind of from my experience, what I'm seeing. All right, so usually it's uh, the custodian's IRA. And then from there, you're listing the IRA specifically, it's vesting in, in uh, section F. And then they're providing all the information below, you know, the structure, you know, this is going to be an IRA. Uh, they're listing the percentage of the profit losses, capital, all that from beginning to end, right? Uh, for you specifically, I've had, I've had clients ask, well, I have no idea where, how do I even get UDFI information? How do I know? What am I looking at? Right? Uh, generally speaking, in box 20, is where it's gonna it's gonna show that information, or at least it's gonna indicate that it has that information. So if you look on the notes there, box twenty it should list two codes: code AR. Well, generally it's gonna list AR, and it's gonna show the EIN, the unique EIN for the IRA. All right, that's what's gonna indicate like, hey, this IRA has its own unique identifiable number, that EIN. It's also gonna list code V. Code V is just saying, hey, we have information regarding unrelated business income tax. All right, the unrelated, the so UBTI in this case, unrelated business taxable income, and we're going to provide that to you. All right, and that's when they'll provide that. If you have any questions or if you ever work on the CPA and the CPA has questions, uh, there's, if you Google the 2023 partners instructions for a schedule, uh, schedule one, form 1065, this is found on the IRS's government, uh, the IRS's website. Very handy, very helpful, pretty plain English uh, illustrating what you're looking for on that K-1. Obviously, each one's going to be unique, so you want to talk to your CPA, make sure that it's being handled for you. All right, so with that, because the Schedule K-1 is going to be each individual partner split, right? Well, now the IRA that has that taxation, that tax obligation, well, now the IRA has to file a tax return. And that's going to be done via a 990T. That 990T is just the exempt organization business income tax return, right? This is just you saying, hey, I know normally I don't owe taxes, but in this case I do because of the structure of the investment that I pursued, and this is how I'm going to pay it. So what you would do is essentially you're going to work with the CPA. You're going to get the 990T completed with that CPA. And then from there, if you're a Quest client, what you'll do is you'll log on to your online portal. You'll go through what's called your expense pay system. We have expense pays specifically dedicated to 990Ts. So you just upload that 990T, and let us know how you want us to make that payment. And then what we're going to do is we're going to make the payment via our elect, uh, what's called our EFTPS system, Electronic Federal Tax Payment System. So as the custodian, we are making the payment to the IRS on the IRA's behalf via the instructions provided to us on the 990T. All right. So let's wrap all that up take a look at a syndication investment. So in this one, let's just say this is a five-year deal. Capital needed was 10 million. They borrowed 7 million. So it's debt leveraged 70%. The initial investment that you made was 50,000 and your return on that investment is 50,000. So obviously you got back a full, you got back 100,000, 50,000 of it being profit, right? So generally speaking, within the first, let's say, you know, three years of this uh, this investment, you receive those K-1s and that K-1 is showing a negative value. Not to be alarmed. Not to be alarmed. This is normal. All right. And the way to think about it is, well, let's say, let's say they purchased land and they're, they're now building a multifamily complex on it. Well, they're spending a lot of money. A lot of money is going into it for the acquisition, the development. You know, we're making sure we're, we're getting everything uh, surveyed correctly. We're getting everything plotted correctly. There's a lot of things that go into just simply the acquisition and development. So we're spending a lot of money. We're not making any income. This is by design. So you're getting those negative values, which is that forced depreciation on there. Now, if you were making this investment personally and you were a full-time real estate investor, you could claim that depreciation against your own personal income. However, the IRA in this case is the investor, not you. Well, the IRA doesn't have any taxable income. 
That's perfectly fine. This can be carried over. So we're going to hold on to those K1s, let's say for the first three years. Year four, we break even or it's a negligible amount. And then year five is when we receive our full return. So we make $50,000 profit, right? Well, it was 70% debt leveraged. So of that 50,000, 35,000 is considered taxable. So again, now that we've opened up the IRA to taxation, we've also opened it up to deductions. That's where we're going to use those K-1s from the first couple of years to apply against that taxable income that the IRA just experienced. This is why even though I'd say 95, if not higher percent of syndications will trigger UDFI within the IRA, it's still one of the most popular investment strategies that we see because not only of its passive nature, but because that tax obligation is usually minimized to a point where it's almost negligible because of the depreciation that the IRA is able to utilize from the negative values on those K-1s, right? So I know that was a lot. That was a lot. Please let me know if you've got any questions, um, but that's it for me. That's all. That's the full presentation. Um, uh, like Deanna mentioned, we do have the Quest Expo coming up June 27th through the 29th. Uh, it's going to be in Irving, Texas, or well, Dallas. It's going to be the Irving Convention Center. Uh, if you have any questions regarding that expo, you know, feel free to scan that QR code right there. It'll take you to the website. You can see the full agenda. Uh, I know Mike's going to be speaking there like we talked about before, Deanna. Uh, Mike's going to be going over commercial real estate and the trends that are shaping the market today and in the future. I'm always like when we go to the Freedom Founders event, uh, just to kind of be the ear sitting next to Mike as he's talking about this because he's got a lot of insight and he thinks about it in ways that not a lot of people do, uh, which is something that I always find valuable. It's always like getting his opinion on that. Uh, so that's a topic that I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to. Uh, right now, we're running uh, a promotion. All tickets are 50% 50, 50 off if you just use Expo 50 code, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the Tempo code. Um, and as a special treat, what we're going to do is for anyone on this call right now, uh, if you're looking to go and you're on the fence, send us over an email. We're going to give you a free Expo ticket, uh, free of charge. We have up to 10 of them, up to 10 of them to get away, give away. So feel free to reach out to us. And we'll get those applied to you. And you can reach out to us uh, by emailing IRA specialist with an S at the end at questtrust.com. You can email me specifically at Zachary.Wilson at questtrust.com. And then also you can scan that QR code if you want to set up a free consultation with an IRA specialist. And that is it for me, everybody. Oh, well, thank you, Zach. And yeah, definitely, if you are in the area, you should definitely come. It's several days long. So we would love to have you come to our dinner. We're going to host at the expo as well. We'll put on another presentation different than what we're going to do on stage at um, the expo, but there's going to be so many great speakers. So definitely don't want to miss that. If you are able to make it, reach out and we'll make sure you can come. Um, I did see one question uh, come up. So if there is anyone else who has questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand and we'll go ahead and answer those for you now. Um, so the question I see is that the this person had a syndicated debt leverage investment with their IRA that lost all its value. And uh, they have other syndications that had taxes based on leveraged income, UDFI. And they wonder if the loss can be offset by the UBIT tax. Can the loss be carried forward to offset the future gains from the debt leverage investment? So uh, this one, you definitely want to talk to a CPA. Um, I don't believe so. I think the depreciation has to be derived from that investment itself. And so you're looking at, you know, that, that cost segregation that's showing up on the K-1s. I don't think the loss from one syndication within the IRA can be applied to the tax obligation against another one. I could be wrong on that, though. Definitely talk with a CPA, but I don't think so. I don't think you would be able to. Yeah, and I just want to mention also in September, we're going to have Brandon Hall come on and talk about uh, a lot of different topics like depreciation and um, the exact question that you're asking actually was emailed to me from Brandon Hall. So if you're not on his email list, you should definitely sign up because he sends out these really good pieces of information and topics and blogs, and he's all about um real estate investing. So he's a great guest to have. We had him on earlier this year talking about K-1 specifically. And so later on this year, we're, we've had several people ask 
for him again. So we're going to have him on again and we're going to talk in depth about different things that have come up this year for everyone. And, um, you know, disclaimer that this person's debt leveraged investment was not with tempo. <laughs> um, <laughs> just want to put that out there, but definitely understand because I have some investments myself that are, you know, not doing as well, or they have lost all of their value and they're also not with tempo. And I have some CPA questions for that. Um, but IRA specific questions are what Zach can answer. Um, so if, uh, if you have any IRA specific questions on processes and, um, you know, the Roth conversion, uh, there's a lot of different opportunities that Zach can answer on. And like I said earlier, the Quest YouTube channel is amazing. I learned so many things from that um, for myself, for my kid. For my family members, I've shared their videos with a lot of people and it's a great resource for information. Um, but there are some, you know, tax related questions that Zach cannot answer because he's not a CPA. Yeah. And um, so unfortunately we can't answer your personal tax questions, but we definitely are here if you need us for any other um, information about your IRA. And so if you would like to reach out to us, please go ahead and do so. And we will get back to you with as much information as we can and answer those questions for you and help make the process a smooth, easy transaction. Hopefully we can get it done as quickly and um, painless as possible. Absolutely. And yeah, Fred, uh, just answered uh, Dave, your question. You can feel free to shoot me over an email, Zachary.Wilson at questtrust.com regarding that, uh, that free expo ticket. Next question is, can we withdraw our principal from our Roth IRA without any taxable event? So whenever it comes to distributions from a Roth IRA, they're going to come out in three different waves, right? The first thing that's going to come out is those conversions. I'm sorry, is the contributions. So funds put directly from your checking or savings into that Roth IRA come out tax and penalty free, no matter what, no matter how long, how old you are, how long you've had the Roth IRA open. Uh, the second thing to come out is going to be the conversions. Now, conversions, these are the funds that will be converted over from things like your traditional IRA. Each conversion has its own five-year clock. Now, what that five-year clock dictates is whether or not those funds are going to be subject to a 10% penalty if you were to take them out before the age of 59 and a half. So two solutions to that is either when you convert after five years, right? After that conversion has sat in the Roth IRA for five years, it's treated like a contribution. So it comes out tax and penalty free, no matter how old you are. Now, let's say you do the conversion at the age of 62. Well, you're over the age 59 and a half based off of uh, IRC 72T. That means you now are not subject to that 10% penalty. So even though you converted it, you can take the funds out without any sort of uh, tax obligation because, well, you paid taxes on it, the income tax on it as you converted it. And then you're now past the age 59 and a half. So you're not subject to that 10% penalty. So that's really two solutions um, when coming to taking the funds out. Now, the final thing is going to be the earnings. Earnings have to be a fully qualified distribution in order to avoid any tax or penalty on that. All right. So I hope that I hope that answers your question. Thank you. I have a question. Okay. So I have a pre-tax 401k from old companies and um, I want to get them to a, a can I use my... Well, I guess I have to use the old company contributions, right, to, to convert to a self-directed IRA before I invest. Um, or is there a way for me to invest? I know that there is a way to invest with like an app like Fidelity mm -hmm. and um, into real estate. And then how do I convert over to a Roth from there? Like, is it still the same kind of process? How do I get it from fidelity to a self-directed IRA basically? And then yeah. um, take it from there to get that Roth conversion benefit. Yeah. So anything held within like an old employer plan, uh, if the overall goal was to get them into a Roth, um, it's going to happen one of two ways, right? So for the funds that are sitting pre-tax in that 401k, which is going to be the, the whole account for a lot of people, although some people will have elected to do Roth contributions. We'll cover that in here in a sec. But for the pre-tax funds, 
what we generally like to do is we like to avoid what's called midair conversions. It's kind of, that's the term we've coined. Um, essentially, it just means that, hey, rather than it going from your pre-tax 401k directly to that Roth, right, where a lot of reporting cannot sync up, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to roll over from the 401k to a traditional IRA, and then from there we're going to we're going to convert from the traditional IRA to the Roth IRA. Right? That way, this movement is reported properly, and then this movement is reported properly. Now, if you've got funds that were sitting in the Roth portion of the 401k, those can be rolled over directly to your Roth IRA because they're already sitting post tax. Okay. I think the next question actually was the same question, or maybe it's the same answer. How about pre-tax 401k, convert them to Roth IRA and take out principal after five years mm -hmm. without further taxes? That sounds right. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. So I know regardless of where those funds originated from, essentially, once they're converted to the Roth, they start their own five-year clock. Um, and so whether it is you are you wait till the end of that five-year period or you turn 59 and a half before that five-year period ends, once you meet one of those two requirements, you can take those out. Can you speak on kids? So um, I have a teenager and I would like to contribute to their Roth IRA. How long, how old are they when I'm not allowed to do that anymore? And do you have any um, tips, tricks, or industry secrets that you can share with us on how to help them get set up for their future? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, believe it or not, regardless of how young they are, you actually are never the one technically contributing, right? Obviously you being the parental guardian, you're physically, you know, controlling the funds and you're, you know, you're requesting them to be sent over, but this is an actual contribution made by them as an individual, right? The biggest thing whenever we're looking to do this strategy is that they have income reported, right? Because that's the qualification in order to be able to contribute to a Roth is that you have earned income at least up to the amount that you're looking to contribute. So essentially what would happen is you would, you would work with a CPA to be sure, Hey, all right, they are either paid by me or they have their own job, something like that. Right. Uh, as long as it's reported as earned income, then they're eligible to make that contribution. And even though you're the one sending the funds to the Roth IRA as the, as the, their guardian, right. As a responsible individual, those funds are still acting as a contribution under their, essentially their social security number, right? Them as the individual. So uh, really that's the biggest thing is just being sure they've got that reported income. Good to know. I am getting more and more interested on legacy things. And actually we're going to do a lunch and learn on legacy investing in um, August. So that's coming up quick, but uh, we're going to talk about trusts next month, so I hope to see you there. If you have any questions, um, you can email them to us again, or uh, we did just get this last question in, but this is the last one we're going to do, okay? Um, and if there's any other questions, we will definitely re respond to you via email. Um, so here's the last question, Zach. If one spouse is working and the other is not, if we meet the contribution limit, can the non-earning spouse contribute to, to towards the Roth IRA without any earned income? And um, and we did answer that actually earlier in the talk. Um, if they're filing jointly, right. married jointly, then they can contribute to the non-working spouse. And um, same thing for kids under four. If they don't have any earned income, can we contribute to the Roth IRA? We also just answered that. Um, so are you seeing a lot of people doing that for their kids? Are they starting an LLC and paying their kids for chores or how are they doing that? Yeah, so uh, really it's something that we definitely are seeing a lot more, you know, as these types of accounts become more and more popular. Um, and so just to touch on both, you're absolutely right. You know, like, like we said earlier, as long as you guys are filing jointly, one spouse's compensation counts as the other spouse's compensation as well, eligible to make a Roth conversion. Now for the kids, uh, how they're getting paid really is, believe it or not, pretty unique to each scenario. We've seen some where, okay, I have, uh, people have paid their kids for like uh, what they call modeling. It'll be like posting things on Facebook and that's how they'll pay them. We've seen some where they hire them under their own. If they have a business already, they'll hire them under there and they'll hire them like, like a part-time employee and they'll pay them that way. So really the way it happens will be unique to each individual situation. And then that is how, you know, that's going to be the biggest thing is, uh, just making sure you talk with the CPA so that they're, it's everything's being filed and reported correctly so that they're eligible to make the contribution. That way you aren't hit with the excise tax. If your child is a 1099 employee, can you do that contribution for them still? 
<laughs> I think so. I think you can, as long as that 1099, uh, I think it's like the 1099 if it's on the, oh man, I can't, there was, I remember talking to a CPA about this. Um, and so I, I don't know the exact, I don't know the exact uh, mechanics of it, but yes, from, if I remember correctly, yes, they could. Awesome. Well, Zach, thank you so much for your time today. Um, if you would like to reach out to Zach, his email address is zachary.wilson at questtrust.com. Cool. And um, you can also email me and I'll get you in touch with him. Uh, but we look forward to seeing you next month on the next Lunch and Learn. Thank you everyone for being here and have a great thank weekend. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Y'all have a good one. Thanks.